from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, my name is Todd Harvey. I'm a curator at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. I'd like to welcome you to the latest presentation in our ongoing Benjamin Botkin lecture series. And this is what we call an open mic session. So it's a slightly different format. The Botkin series allows us to highlight the work of leading scholars in the disciplines of folklore, ethnomusicology, oral history, and cultural heritage while enhancing the collections here at the American Folklife Center. For the center and the library, the Bakhtin lectures form an important facet of our acquisitions activities. Each lecture is videotaped and becomes part of the permanent collections of the center. In addition, the lectures are later posted as webcasts on the library's website, where they're available for viewing to internet patrons throughout the world. So now would be a good time to turn off your devices if you wish. Um, Today I have the, the honor of, of introducing Jamie Stone, who uh, with his band just gave a, an amazing concert in the Coolidge Auditorium. And, and if you're looking at the webcast, I, I think you need to go back and look at the concert first. Because what I'm going to try to do today is to, is to bring some context to that, um, to that event and to uh, help, uh, help us and you all, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on behalf of you in the audience to, uh, to better understand what it's like to be a, a, a touring gigging musician at, at this point in time and also to better understand the style that, that Jamie's bringing to, uh, to Library of Congress materials. So I just want to say thank you, Jamie. That was a, a really amazing performance. Uh, thank you. I mean, it is such an incredible honor. Um, to be in this building always, but especially to, to play. I mean, I could, you know, like, you know, I've spent some time um, down in the basement um, and uh, I could feel it, you know, they, there's that old saying of, you know, like we stand on the shoulders of our elders and I, I felt like quite literally um, being, you know, uh, on stage with the incredible history of, of music here that's informed, uh, informed this project in so many ways. So yeah, it's definitely an honor. Yeah, how did you feel about the performance today? It felt amazing. Yeah, it was really nice. Um, you know, knowing, you know, in, in the same vein that, you know, the same space that Alan Lomax recorded Jelly Roll Morton and, you know, the Josh White and um, the Golden Gate Quartet record was made there. So, it, you know, it felt like there was some history there. And also it's a point in time in this project where, you know, having... Uh, been doing this for the last about five years or so um, feels like the band is seasoned. There's like a kind of family-like chemistry. Um, I feel really, really proud of this new record and the work that we're doing and we're a little bit like in that phase of touring where we're kind of on fire because we've been playing every night. So it's, it's kind of nice to be in that particular phase and then get to do, you know, a concert like this. Yeah, it felt, felt really good. Well, yeah, if I, if I could... Um think of one word to sum it up, it was, it was a tight performance, mm. no doubt. And um, I'm just wondering, where do, you, where do you find musicians like that? Well, um, uh, Toronto, <laughs> Vermont, and Nashville, precisely. Um, and uh, people often ask us that, like, you know, how in the world do you find them, and where did you meet, and how do you rehearse, and all these, you know, questions spin uh, when they hear where we're from. And, and it's really a testament to these particular musicians, um, all of whom I know in different ways, um, essentially through the very tight-knit group of, um, you know, folk musicians who, you know, I like people that have a foot in, in the traditional camp but are also experienced doing um, a lot of other music and have really uh, wide-ranging sensibilities because that's what it, it takes to, you know, treat the material in the way that we do. Um, so Morris Smiley, um, I was given a record of hers by a mutual friend um, probably like more than 15 years ago. Um, and she in turn had heard my music. And um, when my wife and I were getting married, we were trying to think of like the absolute perfect music. Um, and, and of course it, it had to be 
just so, you know, and I wanted it to be so many things, and, and she was somebody that I was like, okay, we should get more. I had never met her, um, and so I, we looked on her tour schedule, and uh, lo and behold, she was finishing a tour in Boulder, where I lived, uh, the day before our wedding. Um, so it was a kind of serendipitous meeting, and um, we met on my wedding day, and we've been friends ever since, and then when I first started um, gathering together people for the you know, collaboratory of the Lomax project. Um, she was one of the first that I thought of and we've been playing music ever since. And, and Joe Phillips, the bass player, um, we've been playing for almost 10 years together um, and we've done everything from work with symphonies and chamber ensembles to playing, you know, music from around the world and doing folk traditions. And so all of that is in his playing and, um, and, and in our history. And um, Sumaya Jackson is the person who's newest to this group and she's been doing all the touring for the last two years. And she was um, at the Berklee College of Music in the American Roots program. Um, that's a, an incredibly vibrant, very forward thinking, um, uh, you know, uh, folk and roots music uh, kind of a breeding ground. Um, and I actually called up all of my uh, friends there on faculty and I said, you know, I'm looking for a fiddler, you know, who's the perfect person for this project. And they all, um, without having spoken before, they all said Sumaya Jackson. Um, so um, th that's them. Yeah. It, it's really exciting um, group and you, you mentioned being on tour, I saw on your schedule you got a, a tour next week every night in California or something like that. Is is this, um, you, you've been touring with this recording? Yeah, yeah, the new record um, officially came out in April, but we had them at the beginning of the year. Um, and usually as the uh, record cycle goes, you know, when a, a new album comes out, we sort of try and, try and traipse, uh, zigzag around as much as we can. Um, so, you know, I have, uh, I have a family. I've got two young kids, three and seven, um, so I can't go out for really long tours. Um, uh, so, you know, we're, we're out for something like a week to two weeks a month, um, which is a, a good amount in that first, you know, six or nine months of a record being out, and then it, it, it can pare down a little bit. Um, I... I I took the opportunity to look at um, some of the videos that you made with uh, the Lomax project, and I, this is kind of a second phase to that. And one of the comments that the musicians in, in that band um, made over and over again was that um, it was a, a joy to work with you because you are a good band leader. Mm -hmm. And um, I, th I think that's, that's worth exploring a little bit. What, what makes a good band leader? It's a good question. Um, I've done it for a long time. I think, you know, I started playing banjo 22 years ago and very soon after knew that I wanted to play the banjo in a way that didn't particularly exist. Um, and I wanted to make music that combined things that were, um, you know, not typically found together. So it was clear that I wasn't gonna get a call. Like no one was gonna say, you know, come play bowed banjo on my record or, you know, we have this idea for a project of West African music or, you know, we want a chamber symphony with banjo. Or, you know, so if I was going to do the things that, you know, were lighting up in my head, I would have to create it. Um, and so I've been thinking for a long time how to cultivate and create a context, you know, um, for the things that I wanted to do. And that really involves people and working with people. And um, I love collaborating. and. Um, you know, uh, what comes to mind is actually, uh, there's a, a beautiful um, movie that Vim Vendors made about Pina Bausch, have you seen this? Um, she's the amazing choreographer and she worked with the same company, of course, people came in and out, but for many, many, many years and she had this process where she would essentially present like prompts. Um, uh, you know, she would say like, you know, what is it what does it look like in your arms to, you know, be a cactus or, or something like that? Or, or things, you know, related to whatever theme that she was beginning to cultivate for a certain piece of choreography. And, um, and they would move um, how, you know, they felt like naturally, you know, from that. And then she would make notes or later photograph and film and she would curate, you know, their own personal language 
and, and she had the big umbrella vision, you know, and she was the choreographer, but she really used their voices or their bodies in a way. And um, I remember being really moved when I saw that film because it was uh, something I'd been trying to do, but maybe a little bit shyly because I felt like, you know, maybe I needed to be more of a capital C composer and, you know, write out all the parts and, you know, um, and I've done some of that, but what I find most satisfying is to really find people that have a, a singular way of playing um, and that I resonate with and create a process by which they can really be themselves and then I can kind of go back in and figure out like what works together and, and, and shape it. So I think of myself almost as a curator of the music or the arrangements um, rather than sort of coming in with a big monolithic so, vision. So that must nece necessitate uh, a lot of rehearsal time up front. Is that, is that true? That's true. Um, I've also been working with people I've known for a while. So, um, you know, you know, musicians who are steeped in all the things that these musicians are, you know, where they're, they're improvisers and they know traditional music and they, we, we share a lot of references. You know, I can say like, oh yeah, you know, we want this thing that's like a Bobby McFerrin circle song, you know, and, it, and that can be like, right. You know, and when you work with people that are cut from the same cloth or, or you know, you have a history with, there's this shared language and, and you'd be astonished at how quick the, the process can, can be, you know, with, with really great musicians. Right. And then there's a secondary process where you then hone and, you know, things get seasoned. But a lot of times, you know, I, I, I've become a m bigger believer in like that, you know, first thought, best thought. Sometimes, you know, like that arrangement of old paint mm -hmm. kind of came to, it was the first thing that we ever did with uh, Tim O'Brien and Maura Smiley and Margaret Glaspie and Greg Garrison. And um, Margaret had brought in, um, well, actually, there's this really curious Lomax recording where he he's um, interviewing Vera Hall, you know, from Livingston, Alabama. And um, he, he actually starts, she was such a phenomenal singer that he started testing her to see if she could sing back whatever melodies you know he played her or sang to her, and so he actually uh, played her a recording of "Goodbye Old Paint," which was not in her repertoire, not a song she did, and she hummed it back, you know. And of course, like all you know, amazing musicians couldn't help, but, you know, came out sounding like her. Um, and it was actually that that little snippet for 25 seconds, uh, no words, you just hum the melody. Um, that, that Margaret Glasby used to kind of rework the verse. She brought that in and, and it just sort of happened in a round, you know. I said, well, you know, we, need, we can't leave out the chorus and the whole part of the story. And so I wrote, you know, the, the chords for this and then Tim O'Brien um, kind of quickly pulled out some songbooks and got online and, uh, and we sort of collaged together lyrics from different places. Oh, I like that verse, I don't like that verse. Mm. Um, and. Uh, and then we just played it a bunch, and, and it just kind of happened in a way out of out of thin air, you know, it just this community spirit. And that's, that's you know, kind of oftentimes, I think, where the magic happens. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I am um, curious, as I ask about uh, rehearsal time, about the mechanics of uh, putting out a record, touring it, getting the musicians in the same city at the same time. Um, and, and I noticed that you, you do a little bit of coaching, right? Some com mm -hmm. is, um, can, can you um, tease that out a little bit for us? What, what, are, the, what, is, what are the economics like and, and how, how can I become a touring musician? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, um, the margins are slim. Um, <laughs> You know, I have been, uh, I you know, existing, orbiting in a world of, you know, folk and world music and people that are, um, you know, making the music that they really want to make, you know, um, and, and following artistic rather than popular choices. I mean, I made instrumental music only for <laughs> a good long time. This is actually the first project that has singing in it. Um, for the most part. Um, and, and you're singing as and well. And I'm singing, yeah, that's a whole new thing. But um, So anyway, yeah, the margins are slim and, and uh, you know that word you use, organize, is really what it's all about. And, and if I have a skill as a band leader, that's a big part of it, um, is being very, very, very organized, especially when you're dealing with 
busy musicians that are all involved in lots of projects. Joe was in an orchestra for years. Um, Maura you know, sings in three bands and has her own solo career and is a composer. Um, and, and so, um, you know, doing, I do my own booking, um, which is somewhat unusual. I'm self-managed and do my own booking, um, and uh, which is common at a certain like grassrootsy level, but, um, you know, for doing the kind of stuff that we're doing these days, it's a little unusual. Um, so I have to be really organized also just to maintain some semblance of balance, having a creative life, you know, actually feeling like I'm a, I'm a musician and I'm not just kind of sitting at a computer sending emails um, and having a family and all of these things. So um, I, 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 you know, you can ask people that know me. I, I don't usually waste a second. You know, if there's like three minutes between something, I'll just get something done. Um, and uh, um, so yeah, being, being organized, um, I plan really far in advance and that tends to be uh, the way to work with great musicians. <laughs> you know, because you can't call up an amazing musician and say, I have a gig at the Library of Congress next week. Are you available? Because they're not. Um, but if you do it a year ahead or longer, then it, it works out, so, yeah. And, and how does your record label figure into this? Do, are they helpful in terms of um, booking? And yeah, they, they don't do any booking stuff. Um, I'm, I'm currently with Borealis Records, who put out the Lomax Project and this new Folklife record. I released six records independently before that. Um, so I'm used to just the, like, roll up your sleeves, you know, do it all yourself. Uh, kind of mode, so I often am like steering the ship. They're very helpful and they have a nice little team, um, but uh, I I'm often the one coming in with ideas and energy, but it's very nice these days to have a, a support network and um, they're a Canadian company, so they also have access to some grants which um, make the uh, financial um, picture um, uh, really nice. Um, because these days, um, as people are streaming music from out in the so-called cloud, um, uh, where musicians are paid practically nothing, um, the economics of making beautiful records with 60-page liner notes and uh, multiple visits to the Library of Congress for research, and, you know, it becomes um, uh, rather, rather difficult. Um, and so, you know, part of the, part of the feat in a way, I actually feel like um, I, you mentioned the coaching work that I do. I've been developing um, slowly but surely an, an online course called Compose Your Career to offer tools for musicians, um, independent musicians, to um, kind of learn how to make it work. Um, and, uh, um, you know, one of the things for me is I actually feel like your career is like the ultimate improvisation. <laughs> Because the stakes are high, you know, I mean, uh, it, especially as you get older um, and if you're supporting a family or like, you know, paying a mortgage or whatever. Um, and, and like on stage, you know, you can, you can reach for some idea that you're hearing in your head and if it doesn't work out, like, it's gone. I mean, maybe someone will replay it on a video, but, um, you know, uh, uh, nobody's going to get hurt, <laughs> you know. No one's going to starve if you hit a wrong note. Um, but with your career, it's like, it's a real thing to figure out in the actual world, which is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the technology is changing and the mediums are changing and the whole business model and what people like and don't like. And so it's, a, it's quite, quite a ship to steer. So, so touring is, a, is an important part of that um, yeah. because of it's a paycheck? I mean... Yeah. And, and also, you know, people love to hear experience mm -hmm. live music. Um, and as much as music has become commodified in many ways, um, in, in ways that I don't think benefit artists many a time, it's actually touring where you're there in a room alive making music. Um, there, there's something um, very compelling. And I, I think more than ever these days, you know, statistics seem to be continuing to show that, you know, people want to go see live music. And so I'm thankful for that. And also that's... That's where the whole thing, you know, really, that's where the magic happens. I wonder who, who you would think um, are your peers in terms of uh, folks doing the same kinds of things. Yeah, um, well, um, you know, many, many of my friends, <laughs> you know, hundreds, if not uh, maybe a thousand um, people that I know that are, uh, you know, out there doing this. I mean, people that I look up to 
um, are like, uh, you know, Rhiannon Giddens and Don Flemons from the Carolina Chocolate Drops who are, you know, very successful making music that I think is really important. Um, and uh, yeah, I can think of a lot of, a lot of people. Um, and I actually feel really blessed. You know, I um, usually go to this music conference called APAP and um, the Arts Presenters Conference in um, New York every January. And uh, I was there for a week, a little longer than usual, and I only had one performance. And I got to spend a lot of time just having informal sessions, making music with people. I went out and saw music every night. And, um, and, and there was this incredible, you know, hang after every show where friends and, you know, heroes of mine, you know, were all just there. Um, you know, I went to go see Sam Amidon, who I'm a really big fan of, um, who, who does similar such work, um, you know, bringing his own kind of like indie pop production sensibility to old folk songs that he grew up with in Vermont and mm -hmm. heard on field recordings and that kind of thing. And, um, and after, you know, the audience was half like my favorite musicians around New York and elsewhere. And there was this just amazing energy because it's like, wow, these are our people. Like everybody's a little bit crazy to be doing this. And also these are the people that are actually doing it, you know? Um, and and it's, it's, I, I feel very grateful that I get to do it and that I get to know people um, that are somehow able to make this whole crazy thing work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I, I am counting maybe seven recordings under your, under your name mm -hmm. going back a, a decade or so, which is a pretty, pretty good clip. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think I recall when we first met, you were working on a thing with the, with the Boulder Symphony. I wonder if, if that was um, uh, Other Side of the Air, which was 2013, 2014 yeah. kind of recording. Um, what, what I'm interested in is how um, your, um, how your style has changed over time or how the, how the product has, has changed um, and um, ultimately, of course, where it's going. But, but if we could go back to that and, and contrast it with the Lomax collection, what was that one, what was that recording like, Other Side of the Air? Yeah, so that was a, a record I made, um, much of which were my own original compositions, which is largely what I had done um, before, although um, very influenced by um, field recordings from other places in the world. Um, so there's a first piece on that record is called Radio Wasulu, and um, I made a record called Africa to Appalachia in 2008 um, after traveling to Mali. Um, and I made a bunch of recordings as I traveled around and um, kind of continued to use those as a touchstone. Um, so even on that album, um, there was two very West African inspired pieces. Um, there's also a piece on there called The Cinnamon Root that um, has influences from um, you know, North African music and Indian music and Persian music. And um, so I, I'm sort of pulling in threads of music that I love and listen to into my own original music. Um, and, uh, and then around the time I was working on that, you know, body of pieces, a dear friend of mine, Andrew Downing, who lives in Toronto, who's a fantastic composer, um, got asked to write um, a, um, piece for an orchestra that had a folk element. And so he just called me and said, uh, I want to write you a banjo concerto, are you game? Um, and I, of course, said yes. Um, so um, I, we were trying to find a home and, you know, things in the classical world are, you know, can take years before you can actually get an orchestra to record a piece. And I was too impatient. And so I just said, well, I'll just put it on this other side of the air record. And then with the chamber symphony there, I decided that I would try and score for the first time um, a bunch of my own compositions for chamber ensemble. And uh, I felt completely out of my depth. And I remember, I remember actually being in a hotel room in Rochester, New York after playing the Rochester Jazz Festival and pulling open um, the uh, music notation software called Sibelius with uh, 17 empty staves. And I'm, you know, I'm a banjo player. I, I, I can read music, but very slowly and not well, and mostly everything's by ear in my world. And I was just like, and I called my friend Andrew, I'm like, I really don't think I can do this. And he's like, you can do it just one note at a time. And that was that, I just sat there and I just started writing, um, you know, filling up the space in a totally different kind of way than the music that I usually made. Um, 
Anyway, this is getting long-winded, but um, that record was what was happening. You know, I was touring that actually when we started the Lomax project. And in terms of connecting them, you know, there's a thread that runs through all of my work of taking old recordings and kind of finding a way to um, make them newer, using them, you know, in the creative and collaborative process. And um, and and I had read. John Swed's amazing biography of Alan Lomax, the man who recorded the world, and of course had been listening to Lomax recordings for 22 years, you know, since I first started playing banjo, and I sort of put those things together, like what would happen if I took this kind of collaborative process that I've honed and this way of working with old recordings, but then come full circle back to, you know, uh, the folk music that I've always loved and played, but have somewhat shied away from uh, on recording. Um, and, and so those were sort of the ideas that seeded the project. Is there any way to tease out um, certain aspects of, I mean, you're talking about your music, uh, your style, and in, in, um, um, how would you describe your style and, and who may have influenced it? I mean, when I hear it, I'm thinking maybe like John Zorn or um, um, Bill Frizzell. You got it. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, John Zorn, less so, but I, you know, I saw John Zorn with his Masada project um, in New York probably 15 years ago. Um, and Bill Frizzell was a really big influence. In fact, Bill Frizzell was a big influence like musically and in terms of like looking up to someone who had a career that I thought was really happening. Like um, when I got into Bill Frizzell, um, he was making like a record a year solid, a record a year, and every one of them, um, you know, you know, there was the Intercontinentals and the Willies and the uh, East-West Project, and, you know, he, he had a, a, a concept, he kept drawing on many of the same musicians, but always bringing new people into the fold, so there was a continuity aesthetically. Um, he had a singular voice, and he was able to sort of surround the way that he plays, even though it was always evolving, uh, but surround it with you know, new concepts and players and projects and repertoire and um, that record, The Intercontinentals, was a huge influence. In fact, I cried my eyes out the first time I heard it. Um, I got an advanced copy of it from a friend of mine who worked at a record store and I took it back home and put it on and it was like, it was like that experience of like hearing the music that I had only imagined. You know, I love Vinicius Cantuaria, who's a great Brazilian musician who's on that record and I had just uh, been to Mali and Siddiqui Kamara plays Kalabash on that record, and there's songs written for Bubakar Traore, who I had listened to, you know, um, for years. So there's all these things. It was, like, so inspiring. And that idea that, you know, what, what many of us know and love about Bill Frizzell, it's like, what's he up to now? Mm. You know, that thing, you know, he's coming to town, and you think, like, I'm going to go see him. No matter what, it's going to be great. I wonder what he's doing next, you know? And... Uh, and that actually became like, um, you know, people don't love this word, but like if, if there was like a branding that I wanted to have, you know, my dream would be when a music presenter would call and be like, we'd love to have, have you at our festival. Like, what are you up to next? Mm -hmm. What are you doing now? Um, and sort of build a kind of trust that, you know, there's good taste, really great musicians. Um, let's find out where it's going to go next. So, um, and, I mean, tons of other influences. You know, the thing about influences is that nothing goes away. Um, you know, uh, you're an archivist, you know. It's like the, 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 the collection keeps building. And so you keep listening and you keep having new experiences and you play with new people. Um, you know, going to West Africa and playing with West African musicians for a number of years completely altered my playing. Um, and I think of the banjo because it is an Af a West African instrument that came here you know, on slave ships in the 16 and 1700s, and um, I, I really feel that continuity. I have studied not only close ancestors of the banjo, but also all different African, you know, instruments. Um, and so there are times, you know, if I'm playing a piece of Caribbean music where I can quote rhythms and sounds and, you know, palm mute the banjo so it sounds like a thumb piano or, uh, you know, treat the instrument in such a way or do things rhythmically. and I mean, those things don't go away, you know? And it's one thing to know the, the sort of big 
guideposts of style. You know, I, I know when I, I know how to make something sound very much like African music or Cajun music or something, but it's the subtle things that you can kind of pull in without anyone quite noticing um, and can cross pollinate all these different styles. That's the stuff that I'm really interested in. Um, right. I, um, I was, I was struck by what you said, and we should just get this out of the way, right? That, that, um, that um, here we have uh, heirloom seeds, and we're going to plant them in new soil and see what happens. Um, and that is, um, and that's a different approach than a lot of people would take with our recordings. There are the, there are the, uh, the crowd of people over there who want to imitate precisely the intonation and the performance style, as in Lomax performance style. Um, there's the crowd of people over there who um, will imitate it, but not very well. Um, then, and then there's people like you who, who, um, who do something else. And I think they're all, uh, they're all fairly legitimate. And I, and I only have a, a quibble with one thing that you said there, and that is the, the dusty shelf. And <laughs> I, I just have to say, our stacks are clean. They're, they're clean. It's the cleanest place in the world, you know. And, um, and so if you could just help us by pulling that one out of, of your statement. Yeah. yeah, I'll go back with a Sharpie and strike that out of the liner notes. Otherwise, I find no fault with what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a couple of things that are uh, still in my head about your style, and, and I, think, I think this is important because um, you, you, are, you are doing something kind of unique. I've never heard anything like it. Um, you, there are very, very rich orchestrations of uh, these, um, of the bare bones of these things, and they include a lot of uh, substitute chords um, that that aren't the one four five kind of thing that we have. The harmonies are are um, m much built not just on a triad but on the ninth, eleventh, and the thirteenths, um, and the the presentation of it is very chamber-like. Um, are those accurate um, characterizations? Totally accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's intentional. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of our um, aesthetic language um, in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, most, well, <laughs> um, a lot of folk music is very chambery. You know, I mean, chamber comes from the word room, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, old time musicians are making music in a room, you know, singing in a room, filling, filling a hall with, you know, a shape note hymn, um, you know, uh, uh, calling in spaces, call and response, you know, when I see those uh, films of the Georgia Sea Island singers, they're very much alive in the room, making music in the space, the music changes when the space changes, all of those things. Um, of course, we have been uh, influenced by playing chamber music. You know, mm -hmm. we mentioned this project that I did. Joe plays in a symphony. Um, Sumaya was classically trained. Mora sang early music, um, uh, you know, in college and still continues to do work. She can sing opera and all kinds of stuff. So we, we, we share that experience. And for me, it's chamber music is so much about color, dynamics, depth, like arc you know, how to build and develop something over a longer period of time, um, how to sort of, uh, you know, use all of the colors available in an instrument and combine them with all the other uh, instruments and voices. Um, and that's become for me just the hallmark of, um, you know, uh, interesting music making. Um, so, like I said, things don't go away. So no matter what kind of music I play, it's hard not to pay attention to the arc of an arrangement, to um, you know the harmonic possibilities that are uh, you know maybe suggested by a melody, um, and yeah, uh, I think as modern players, it's our uh, you know uh, our blessing and our curse to be reharmonizing things, um, uh, which is you know to sort of recontextualize things. But I mean that's what um, you know it, it's. Uh, it's a way of putting a new shine um, or, you know, putting a, a painting in a frame um, to, to take an old ballad and then kind of recast it 
in this new harmonic space. It makes you hear the same melody in a completely different way. And for me, the preservation work has been done. I mean, that's what Alan Lomax and all of the people that have collected in here, um, I, I, I feel like I can't touch them, you know? Like, um, there's n nothing that one needs to do to Jess Morris's old paint, you know? Go listen to it, it's like so incredible and, <laughs> and it still sounds as vibrant as the day it was made. And um, so there's no need for me to recreate that because it's, it was created and it's there and uh, I go back and listen to it all the time. Um, so for me, what's interesting is to use my own voice and what's interesting. Right, and Myra said, said um, she called Sylvia great sturdy song. And uh, I like that image because sometimes we have this idea that oh, it's it's uh, it's too delicate to mess with. You know, we don't want to uh, we don't want to change these arrangements. We don't want to um, uh, ruin the brand. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I I like it. They're sturdy songs. They can withstand a lot. Yeah, and you know, the other thing about it is um, it's not like the recordings that were captured were somehow, uh, you know, they're not like the platonic ideal of a folk song. You know, there is no, like, John Henry. You know, it, it, the one that appears in a songbook is often uh, one that never even got played. It's just uh, cobbled together from a bunch of different versions and everybody has their, you know, somebody blows through town and um, a local musician hears it it's not on record, they remember a few words, and you know, as Tim O'Brien likes to say, like, yeah, I couldn't understand some of the words, so I just made up new ones. Um, and that's, you know, that's the folk process right there. Um, and you know, we found, we, we spent uh, the afternoon at the Smithsonian Folkways Archive yesterday, and um, there was a beautiful ballad sung by Harold Barker, um, and I, I found it so interesting. I was like, wow, this sounds so different. And Maura was like, yeah, that's because he mixed up two ballads. <laughs> so he sang the verses from one with the chorus of another, and it actually was really fascinating. I was like, we should do that. That's really cool. It sounds mm -hmm. different. Um, and, uh, you know, oftentimes these crooked tunes were just how somebody heard it or, you know, um, uh, how, how, you know, they um, might have been feeling on that particular day. Um, and, and then we hold them up. Uh, as being sort of uh, ideals, um, you know, this is uh, um, what Stephen Wade talks so beautifully about in his book, The Beautiful Music All Around Us, which was um, such a big influence on this project. Um, you know, that, that it's these singular people that have put their own stamp on this music, and it's the tradition, and, and it's those two things kind of that really are the tradition that are working off each other, you know. Um, you, you talked us through the uh, arrangement of uh, Goodbye Old Paint. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about I, I Want to Hear Somebody Pray. Is that the name of that one? Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was very struck by that. And um, how, how, did, how did you get arrive where you are now with that particular song? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because it's even different now than it was on the record. Um, that song, um, well, Bruce Malski, who's an amazing old-time musician who was part of the Lomax project in the early days, and um, he played me um, the uh, Karyaku Lomax record, um, and, and I fell in love with that song. Um, he had actually been to Karyaku on vacation um, and met a few of the musicians and um, thought he discovered this uh, whole new musical culture. And he, I remember he said it was like in the 80s. He was disappointed to find out that Lomax had already been there and recorded all okay. these people. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so uh, we actually at concerts um, started just singing I Want to Hear Somebody Pray, clapping, singing, getting the audience to sing it just as a little a cappella you know, way to finish the show. And, uh, um, and then the night before we recorded the Lomax Project album, um, it was like the night before the last session, um, I was like, I really want to do that tune. But, you know, I don't want to just go and sing it around one microphone. You know, we had done some other stuff like that. Um, and it sounds, there's a sort of polyrhythmicness in the way the clapping relates to the to the singing and it sounds very, you know, it's Caribbean, um, but it sounds very African. Um, and so I, I put, put, put a piece of foam next to the banjo bridge that sort of uh, mutes it in a way that makes it sound like a gourd banjo or almost like a, a, an mbira. Um, 
and and I just wrote this whole like kind of like African sounding banjo part to go with the melody, um, and I was and I I um, I just texted a little recording of it to to Tim O'Brien, um, and I was like, what do you think of doing this? He's like, yeah, sounds great. I'm like tomorrow, he's like, yeah. Um, so um, so we all went in. Uh, on the way to the studio, I uh, don't usually text and drive, but I, I was like, uh, I, I knew that I wanted percussion on it, and there was no percussion on that session at all. Mm -hmm. And so I called my friend Alwyn Robinson, and I was like, are you free for a recording session? He's like, yeah, great, when? I'm like, 10 minutes. He was like, I'm there. Um, so he set up, we were all in one room. Uh, I basically talked through this idea of the arrangement. We played it like three times, and that's what's on the record. Um, and now what you're hearing is, that having been seasoned over a few years now, um, Mora brings this whole kind of improvisational thing. We um, would start just free improvising on the way out at the end, and then eventually, it, just organically at concerts, that would kind of crossfade with bringing back just the singing uh, unaccompanied, sort of full circle back to the original arrangement. And, um, and it's always sort of changing, but. That's how that happened. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> nice, and and when um, there are there are sections that I I can see there's a little improvisation in your performance today, and um, in that kind of space, y you you do this um, uh, there the are little little scalar passages uh, like da 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 yeah. kind of it's not arpeggiated like you would hear with uh, you know some some banjo, and um, I, I wonder if that's one of those signals that hey we're 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 vamping right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's a it's a thing that I do a lot. Um, I uh, another influence that we didn't talk about earlier was um, Steve Reich's music, um, and uh, I've you know I heard music eight, for eighteen musicians like a few years after I started playing banjo and like completely flipped out. Um, and there's something that feels so relatable because. Yeah. It's a lot Could of... Could you do like um, like uh, old paint phase? Right. You know, where you record it and then just slightly slow it, slow yeah. it down? We could. Should we do it? Yeah. Maybe after this? Like, yeah. Let's try it. Cool. I mean, you're already mixing the media, right? Do you know where we can find some reel-to-reels around here? Mm, yes. <laughs> yes. We can do it. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Um, our, our performance is going to be next week. <laughs> I feel like this is a good point to thank you and to and to move to uh, any questions that the audience, since I've hogged all the questions, uh, any questions that our, our audience members might have, um, and I'm seeing uh, a few now. Um, thank you. Um, I'd love to hear about your uh, experience in the archives, how it went about, what, what it physically was like. Todd might have helped you out a little bit. Where did you go? What's the material like? Well, <laughs> the first time I came, um, so I was a little bit rebellious in school um, and uh, never went to university. And I've always been like very curious and studious, but not good with um, institutional learning, um, you could say. Um, and. Uh, um, and so, you know, I showed up here without a library card, having no idea what the rules or credentials that were needed or whatever. Um, I had written Todd earlier to let him know about the project and the idea. Um, and uh, also, by the way, I'm on tour. I gave my band lunch money. And I was like, okay, you guys go for lunch. We've got like three hours before we have to, you know, drive to the next city. Um, and so I showed up um, and uh, uh, you were uh, very generous. Um, not, not, um, surprising. um, maybe you were just in a good mood that day. <laughs> um, but uh, it was pretty clear that, you know, there wasn't the time to, you know, put on the white gloves and, uh, look for things and write it all down and wait for it to come up. So, um, Todd just said, uh, let's just go downstairs. So literally within five minutes of being here for the first time, we were walking around with a shopping cart through the, through the archives. Um, <laughs> Am I allowed to say this out loud? Well, we're not selling anything, just yeah. be clear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and literally pu pulling stuff off of, um, off of shelves. I remember there was like a, a, an odd-shaped box that was bigger than the rest, so of course I was interested in it. And I was like, what's that? And I remember he said, oh yeah, you should take that. And it was all the letters that Woody Guthrie had ever sent to the Lomax family. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, 
and then, you know, I remember even seeing the uh, Ampex um, um, suitcase model, the first stereo recorder that Lomax had used on his whole southern journey. And uh, I recognize, you know, we kind of peered in the box and I recognized it from, um, from the picture. There's this great picture of him with Wade Ward, where Wade's smiling with a few teeth missing, listening uh, on headphones, like probably for the first time, like hearing himself being played back. And, um, and you know, yeah, like you talked about physically, you know, I am someone that very much lives in their imagination. <laughs> Um, and to be quite honest, like a lot of these characters, even when I had read the Lomax biography, you know, they were kind of fanciful stories. And it, it actually wasn't until I was here, there in the basement, um, where it was like, I remember holding the first acetate disc that Lead Belly ever recorded and, and see, you know, seeing the... Um, John Lomax's beautiful handwriting, jotting down notes, you know, good guitar playing, mm. uh, and, um, you know, notes on dust jackets of like who else in the county they should go visit and this kind of thing. And it hit me like, wow, these were real people that had their lives at this intersection of, you know, whatever was happening for them, the music, uh, you know, politics, race relations, like there were so many things that were all kind of in the air as this work was getting done and everybody was trying to figure out how to do it, how to make a living, how to, you know, and it was, so something about it, like, it kind of brought me down to earth in a lot of ways and, and the Lomax project comes with like 60 pages of liner notes and photographs because it became really important to me to like think about where these songs come from and how, how they ended up where they are, yeah. Well, I think then we can uh, we can adjourn. I'd like to excuse me. I'd like to thank Theo Austin for setting this up. I'd like to thank our friends from ITS for making the recording, for all the folks who were able to to make it here in person, and all of you who are watching on the web streaming. And most of all, thank you, Jamie Stone. Oh, thank you. It's a, a real pleasure and honor to be here. Yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.